This is Faith Ignited, the podcast where we put God back into history. Episode 4, A Refining Forge. The high-pitched cry of a bird sounded over Isaac's head. It was the only sound present beside the wind and the disturbance of the snow being kicked beneath the horse's feet. Leaning back in the saddle, he pulled a deep breath of frigid air into his lungs. His nose curled up as it detected the slight smell of smoke. His eyes were drawn to the section of woods that developed into a level plain in the distance. He could see rows of log huts and some of the men outside trying to warm themselves by fires. He couldn't keep the frown of disapproval from appearing on his face. He knew the Continental Army planned to camp through the winter here, but Isaac thought them all very foolish. Valley Forge was much too cold and their cause far too impractical. As a Quaker, he didn't approve of violence, but even if he did, the American cause was futile. How did this band of soldiers, armed with spades of irrational patriotism, think they could defeat Britain? with its fleets and armies covering the land and ocean. It was a cause doomed to failure. As Isaac rode on, he suddenly heard something. He pulled his horse to a stop, straining his ears. It sounded like a voice. Who else would be in this section of the woods? Curious, he dismounted, tying his horse to a sapling. As he followed the voice deeper into the woods, it became clear that the voice belonged to a man. It had a plaintive sound like that of someone engaged in prayer. As he quietly approached, Isaac saw a tall figure kneeling in the snow. His eyes widened as he recognized him as none other but General George Washington. Washington was alone, his sword laying in the snow on one side of him and his cocked hat on the other. His head was bent in deep prayer. Isaac stood riveted in place, so struck by the scene that he couldn't bring himself to move. The words of the prayer pierced him to the heart as he heard the general plead in behalf of the American armies, and for divine aid to further their cause, which was the cause of humanity and of the world. Such a prayer Isaac had never heard from the lips of a man. Finally going back to his horse, Isaac left Washington alone to continue his supplication. When Isaac returned home, he related the experience to his wife, who was equally astonished at what he had witnessed. I never thought a man could be a soldier and a Christian, Isaac murmured, but if there is one in this world, it is Washington. His wife, looking pensive, said, then it is the cause of God, and America can prevail. Isaac nodded, his thoughts spinning. His loyalties were rapidly realigning. After all, who was he to oppose a cause supported by God? In September of 1777, the Americans lost their capital, Philadelphia, to the British. This was a heavy blow, especially considering the string of losses they'd faced leading up to this. It was traditional at that time for armies to camp for the winter and then commence fighting again in the spring. Exhausted, discouraged, and grossly underprepared for the onset of the cold weather, the Continental Army marched into Valley Forge six days before Christmas, 1777. They chose the location because of its proximity to Philadelphia. They'd be close enough to keep an eye on the enemy, but far enough to be able to see them coming if they chose to attack. The Americans had very little food or supplies of any kind. George Washington instructed his soldiers to build log huts, and since there were enough blankets for everyone, many had to use straw as bedding. At least a third of the soldiers had no shoes, and many didn't even have a decent coat, leaving them completely vulnerable to the elements. Cold, starvation, and illness tried the perseverance of every soldier. 2,000 men would die of disease before spring came. Despite the dreadful conditions, Washington chose to stay with his men, promising to share in their hardship and partake of every inconvenience. He wrote to the president of the Continental Congress, Henry Lawrence, saying that unless intervention on their behalf was made, this army might dissolve. On top of that, during this time, Washington also faced opposition from the inside. There were some who felt that he wasn't right to lead. So to say that this was a difficult time is a definite understatement. 
I find the name Valley Forge to be very interesting. Because a forge is a blacksmith's workshop. As a verb, it means to shape something by heating it up and then hammering or beating it. And so it seems appropriate that the place the American troops spent the winter of 1777 was called Valley Forge. Truly, it would be a place of deep refinement and shaping for the American troops. While the British were comfortably passing the winter in Philadelphia, the Americans were starving, huddled around little fires trying to keep warm. It probably seemed like God had abandoned them. But the interesting thing is that the American troops came out more skilled and more united than ever before. They came out an army, really. Something happened at Valley Forge. Something that changed the Continental Army. True, they were trained in more fighting skills, but I believe there was something more. Something holier. You see, George Washington expected strict behavior from his soldiers. He instructed them, saying, The blessing and protection of heaven are at all times necessary, but especially so in times of public distress and danger. The general hopes and trusts that every officer and man will endeavor to live and act as becomes a Christian soldier, defending the dearest rights and liberties of his country. In his Diary of Remembrances, Reverend Nathaniel Randolph Snowden, who was an ordained Presbyterian minister, told the story of Isaac Potts' encounter with George Washington's prayer in the woods. Snowden adds to that account, speaking of Washington, I felt much impressed in his presence and reflected upon the hand and wonderful providence of God in raising him up and qualifying him with so many rare qualities and virtues for the good of this country and the world. Washington was not only brave and talented, but a truly excellent and pious man of God and of prayer. He always retired before a battle and in any emergency for prayer and direction. What an amazing thing in a military leader, really, isn't it? It was during this dark time that it seems Washington frequently sought light and aid from a heavenly source. Now, I want to tell you of an experience Washington had in Valley Forge. Something absolutely extraordinary. Wesley Bradshaw stared up at the looming structure of Independence Hall, removing his hat from his head. The red brick building with a tall white steeple made his curious journalist brain turn with excitement. This was a place soaked in history, and it was an appropriate place to visit on July 4th, but that wasn't his purpose for being there. As he approached the door, a familiar face greeted him, his friend Anthony Sherman. The man's deeply wrinkled face stretched in a smile, his hand trembling as it reached forward to shake Wesley's. After they exchanged greetings, Sherman's eyes grew serious as he told Wesley why he'd asked him to meet him there. I want to tell you of an incident of Washington's life, one which no one knows except myself. Mark me, I am not superstitious, but you will see it verified. Wesley's brow creased, his interest peaked. After all, Sherman was one of the last surviving soldiers of the Revolutionary War. Any insight he could recall would surely be invaluable. Sherman led him inside to a bench and beckoned him to sit. As the old man looked over the interior of the room where the Declaration of Independence had been signed, he let out a sigh. I invited you to come here because I wanted to see this building one last time before I go home to God. Wesley nodded at the man's sentiment. Then he pulled out his notebook and quill, prepared to record Sherman's account. Glancing over at his old friend, he said, whenever you're ready. What Sherman recounted that day is one of the most amazing and seldom heard experiences of the Revolutionary War. Let me read you what he told Wesley that day. Sherman said, You doubtless heard the story of Washington's going to the thicket to pray in secret for aid and comfort from God. The interposition of the most divine providence brought us safely through the darkest days of tribulation. One day, I remember it well, when the chilly winds whistled through the leafless trees. Though the sky was cloudless and the sun shone brightly, he remained in his quarters nearly all of the afternoon alone. When he came out, I noticed that his face was a shade paler than usual. There seemed to be something on his mind of more than ordinary importance. Returning just after dusk, he dispatched an orderly to the quarters, who were presently in attendance. After a preliminary discussion of about an hour, Washington gazing upon his companion with that strange look of dignity which he alone commanded, 
related the event that occurred that day. This afternoon, as I was sitting at this table engaged in preparing a dispatch, something seemed to disturb me. I beheld, standing opposite me, a singularly beautiful female. So astonished was I, for I had given strict orders not to be disturbed, that it was some moments before I found language to inquire the cause of her presence. A second, a third, and even a fourth time did I repeat my question, but received no answer from my mysterious visitor except a slight raising of her eyes. By this time, I felt strange sensations spreading through me. I would have risen, but the riveted gaze of the being before me rendered volition impossible. I essayed once more to address her, but my tongue had become useless, as though it had become paralyzed. A new influence, mysterious, potent, irresistible, took possession of me. All I could do was to gaze steadily, vacantly, at my unknown visitor. Gradually, the surrounding atmosphere seemed as if it had become filled with sensations. Everything about me seemed to rarefy, the mysterious visitor herself becoming more airy and yet more distinct to my sight than before. I now began to feel as one dying, or rather to experience the sensations which I have sometimes imagined accompany disillusion. I did not think, I did not reason, I did not move. All were alike impossible. I was only conscious of gazing fixedly, vacantly, at my companion. Presently, I heard a voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. While at the same time, my visitor extended her arm eastwardly. I now beheld a heavy white vapor at some distance rising fold upon fold. This gradually dissipated, and I looked upon a stranger scene. Before me laid spread out in one vast plain all the countries of the world, Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. I saw rolling and tossing between Europe and America the billows of the Atlantic, and between Asia and America lay the Pacific. Son of the Republic, said the same mysterious voice as before, look and learn. At that moment I beheld a dark, shadowy being, like an angel, standing or rather floating in midair, between Europe and America. Dipping water out of the ocean in the hollow of each hand, he sprinkled some upon America with his right hand, while with his left hand he cast some upon Europe. Immediately a cloud raised from these countries and joined in mid-ocean. For a while it remained stationary, and then moved slowly westward until it enveloped America in its murky folds. Sharp flashes of lightning gleamed through at intervals, and I heard the smothering groans and cries of the American people. A second time the angel dipped water from the ocean and sprinkled it out as before. The dark clouds were then drawn back to the ocean, in whose heaving billows it sank from view. A third time I heard the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. I cast my eyes upon America, and beheld villages and towns and cities springing up one after another, until the whole land from the Atlantic to the Pacific was dotted with them. Again I heard the mysterious voice say, Son of the Republic, the end of the century cometh, look and learn. At this the dark shadowy angel turned his face southward, and from Africa I saw an ill almond specter approach our land. It flitted slowly over every town and city of the latter. The inhabitants presently set themselves in battle array against each other. As I continued looking, I saw a bright angel, on whose brow crested a crown of light, on which was traced the word, Union, bearing the American flag which he placed between the divided nation, and said, Remember ye our brethren. Instantly the inhabitants, casting from them their weapons, became friends once more, and united around the national standard. And again I heard the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. At this, the dark shadowy angel placed a trumpet to his mouth and blew three distinct blasts, and taking water from the ocean, he sprinkled it upon Europe, Asia, and Africa. Then my eyes beheld a fearful scene. From each of these countries arose thick black clouds that were soon joined into one. Throughout this mass, there gleamed a dark red light by which I saw hordes of armed men who, moving with the cloud, marched by land and sailed by sea to America. Our country was enveloped in this volume of cloud, and I saw these vast armies devastate the whole country and burn the villages, towns, and cities that I beheld springing up. As my ears listened to the thundering of the cannon, clashing of sword, and the shouts and cries of millions in mortal combat, I heard again the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. When the voice had ceased, the dark, shadowy angel placed his trumpet once more to his mouth, 
and blew a long and fearful blast. Instantly a light, as if of a thousand suns, shone down from above me, and pierced and broke into fragments the dark cloud which enveloped America. At the same moment the angel upon whose head still shone the word Union, and who bore our national flag in one hand and a sword in the other, descended from the heavens, attended by legions of white spirits. These immediately joined the inhabitants of America, who I perceived were all nigh to overcome, but who immediately, taking courage again, closed up their broken ranks and renewed the battle. Again, amid the fearful noise of the conflict, I heard the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. As the voice ceased, the shadowy angel for the last time dipped water from the ocean and sprinkled it upon America. Instantly the dark cloud rolled back, together with the armies it had brought, leaving the inhabitants of the land victorious. Then once again I beheld the villages, towns, and cities springing up where I had seen them before, while the bright angel, planting the azure standard he had brought in the midst of them, cried with a loud voice, saying, While the stars remain and the heavens send down dew upon the earth, so long shall the union last. And taking from his brow the crown on which blazoned the word union, he placed it upon the standard while the people kneeling down said, Amen. The scene instantly began to fade and dissolve, and I at last saw nothing but the rising, curling vapor I first beheld. This also disappearing, I found myself once more gazing upon the mysterious visitor, who in the same voice I had heard before said, Son of the Republic, what you have seen is thus interpreted. Three great perils will come upon the Republic. The most fearful is the third, but in this greatest conflict the whole world united shall not prevail against her. Let every child of the Republic learn to live for his God, and for his land and the Union. With these words the vision vanished, and I started from my seat and felt that I had seen a vision wherein had been shown to me the birth, progress, and destiny of the United States. This vision Washington had that winter is one of the countless miracles that attended the Revolutionary War. We'll cover more in later episodes, but when I think of everything those men endured at that time, a verse from Isaiah comes to my mind. I have created the smith that bloweth the coals of the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. God really is the master blacksmith. He takes unrefined hunks of metal, and through careful heating, beating, and shaping, makes them into something beautiful, something he can use. It's frequently when we're at our lowest points, wading through our darkest days, that we receive the clearest direction from God. Probably because it's when metal gets hot that it's moldable. So when we experience our own valley forges, when we wonder why God let us be kicked out of Philadelphia, we need to trust the capable blacksmith. Though the process may be painful, he will reach out, humble us, enlighten us, and when spring comes, we will realize that the entire process has ignited our faith. Our faith.